Lord, we love you, and uh, we remind ourselves of who you are. Uh, We remind ourselves that you are God, that you are all-powerful, that you are all-knowing, that you oversee history, that you oversee our lives. Lord, we remind ourselves that everything that exists exists because you brought it about. You spoke, and it came to be. The psalmist says you commanded and it was stood firm. The psalmist says that the earth is yours and the fullness thereof belong to you. And tell us that the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims your handiwork. Paul tells us that you are before all things and in you all things are right now holding together. And so, Lord, it's right for us to remind ourselves of all of these truths. It's right for us to remember who it is that we speak to as we pray. And, Father, we confess ourselves worried. Some of us are anxious. Some of us are angry. Some of us, Lord, are uh, uncertain. Lord, the best of us are uncertain. And yet, Father, we know that you are not. Uh, there's nothing that happens outside of your control. There's nothing happens that happens that's outside of your command. We know what your word says, that you are good and what you do is good. And so, Father, it's right for us to pray. It's right for us to come before you. It's right for us to be reminded of these things. Father, we pray for our brothers, Lonnie and Lenny, as they are walking a hard path. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen their spirits, that you would set their minds on you, that you would fill them up with a joy that the world cannot touch, Lord, a joy that death cannot touch. Pray that you would strengthen their minds in these days to know what lies ahead, that because of Jesus Christ they have hope. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen Miss Barbara and Miss Jeannie in these days. Give grace to their families. Lord, we thank you for a successful surgery for Roy. Pray for a speedy recovery. Lord, we thank you for those uh, who you demonstrate your mighty power through. Lord, we pray for those who right now are in need of that in various ways. Pray for the situations that are all throughout this church family. We pray that you would bring healing to brokenness. Holy Spirit, come now and help us as we study your word. Help us to be challenged. Help us to be comforted. Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so tonight we will be in Habakkuk and... Just like uh, we came to Mark chapter 12, verse 13 on Sunday, by God's timing, I think we've come to Habakkuk on uh, this Wednesday night by God's timing. And uh, Habakkuk is, uh, well, I'm open to the gospel of Mark. Um, Habakkuk is a wonderful little book, a very helpful little book. And it's, it's distinct in the Bible, it's distinct in the Old Testament, in that uh, Habakkuk really isn't writing to somebody. He's not uh, communicating a prophetic message from God to somebody. Habakkuk has kind of given us uh, a few pages from his journal for us to read. Habakkuk has given us insight into his own inner turmoil about trying to understand what's going on in the world. He's essentially looking at God and saying, God, um, the world is on fire. Are you aware? And then God says, yes, I'm aware. And then Habakkuk says, well, why aren't you doing anything about it? And so that's kind of the interplay that we see in this little book of Habakkuk. Um, You can see there the purpose of the theme is that God's justice demands that wickedness be punished. 
And Habakkuk's okay with that. He is okay with wickedness being punished. What we'll see is that God punishes wickedness through others' wickedness. And that part he's not okay with. God punishes the wicked in Judah by bringing the wicked from Babylon to carry out his justice. And and Habakkuk is saying, "How, how can that be right? How can that be the case. And so Habakkuk's asking us the question, he's, he's leading us to ask the question, can I trust God? Can I trust what God is doing? Can I trust God when things don't make sense? One question that Habakkuk might sit down with us at the table and ask us or help work, us, help, uh, work through with us is, uh, can I trust God when the wrong man gets elected? Now, I don't know where you fall on the political spectrum, There are a lot of people who are happy. There are a lot of people who are devastated. And there are a lot of people who had their eyes open to realize our country is far more divided than we thought. And it's not, it's not, we're not going to move back together. It's just the world in which we live right now. And so Habakkuk helps us to ask that question. Can I trust God when the wrong people get power? Now, I don't know your heart tonight. Uh, I'll, I'll confess I am a bit anxious. I am, uh, I found myself staying up way too late last night watching the news that ultimately communicated nothing to me. So at 12.30 a.m., I'm like, I'm not learning anything new. And so I rolled over and went to sleep. Um, But I mean, you know, there is anxiety. There is anxiety of what will happen over these next few weeks, what will happen over these next few years, what's going to happen in the next decade. And so and I think it's okay that we r- confess together, um, I am not happy. If, and if you are, that's fine. But it's okay to be honest about your feelings. I think that's one of the things that we struggle with sometimes is, is being honest about our feelings. Because our feelings are real. Our feelings are what we feel. A lot of times when we're confronted with something, we can't really help how we feel right? Now, along with that, we need to understand the Bible says, A, we feel wrongly sometimes. Uh, Just because you feel a certain way doesn't mean it's the right way to feel. Sometimes we're at the mercy of our emotions at times, but it doesn't mean we feel the right things. It doesn't mean we're permitted to act on those emotions. But we need to be honest about how we feel and need to be honest that it's okay sometimes to have worry and anxiety. It's okay for a time, It's okay to have anxiety when you're faced with something you don't understand that you don't like. It's okay to have anxiety for a time. It's sinful to live under that anxiety. It's sinful, like if you watch the news, then your anxiety is through the roof because they just loot the same things over and over and over again. It's sinful to live under that kind of pressure. But just like what we'll see with Habakkuk, when we, when we find ourselves in periods of worry and anxiety, when we are stressed about what's going on in the world, the place we go is to God, and we let God answer those feelings. We let God respond to us as we struggle. So you can see the outline there. It's kind of an, it's, it's an exchange between Habakkuk and God. Habakkuk prays, God answers. Habakkuk prays, God answers, and then Habakkuk worships is what happens. So, uh, as I noted, it's just this, the inner dialogue between the prophet and God. As he's wrestling through the things of faith. Uh, it's a journey of prayer. And what we'll see is that in these three chapters, the prophet moves from wrestling and doubting to trusting. And it's not because he has, you know, um, flexed his muscles of faith and he's, you know, puffed his chest out, holding his chin up. It's not because he has pulled himself up by the bootstraps. It's because God has reminded him of what's true. It's because he has encountered God in the midst of his anxiety and that has corrected him. Uh, One pastor notes that in this book, the reader is invited to join the prophet in discovering a God who works in ways difficult to understand, yet wonderful to behold. Difficult to understand, yet wonderful to behold. Now, a couple of side notes real quick. This is totally a side note. I notice there's a lot of grammatical errors in here. That really bothers me personally, so I'm just apologizing for that. I can't stand that I made those grammatical errors, so sorry. 
Um, but a second thing to note is that Habakkuk is not okay with things in the world. He doesn't find himself at peace with God and therefore at peace with the world. He still doesn't like what he sees. And that's something that we need to understand. We can, at the same time, have a settled faith that God is in control and not like what we see in the world. And that's an okay place to be, as long as we're listening to the right voice. And Habakkuk ultimately finds himself listening to God. So it's wonderful to behold God's working. Sometimes it's difficult to understand what God is doing. Some of you may have been through experiences in your own life like that. You trust that God has purpose in something, but you don't understand it when it's happening. You don't understand why that person died. You don't understand why you lost that job. You don't understand why that friend stabbed you in the back. You don't understand why whatever happened, happened. And yet maybe as time passed on and you began to look backwards at what God was doing back there, oh, I see now. Sometimes he gives us that, sometimes he doesn't. But it's a reminder that sometimes we just don't understand things as they're happening. Uh, in the Old Testament, especially in the time of Israel as these minor prophets are ministering among the people, uh, these, the, the saints, the ones who actually follow God, had a hard time understanding this. They would see uh, the people of God in Judah and Israel uh, just basically disobeying God like it was no big deal, committing all these atrocities. We've talked about that uh, in some of the other prophets, that they condemned the people uh, for murder, for, uh, for being thieves, for being cannibals. We saw all of that, and Habakkuk's kind of standing back and saying, how, how can this be? I don't understand why God, who is a God of justice, would allow these things to happen. And so they struggled seeing the wicked succeed and feeling like God was doing something wrong. But when righteous people get what the wicked deserve, while the wicked go unpunished, wise people are confused and greatly offended. You agree with that? When righteous people get what the wicked deserve, while the wicked go unpunished, that's offensive. Sometimes we wonder, well, God, why would they get, why, why would they succeed when they're doing nothing but flinging mud on your name? And I'm over here trying to live faithfully and quietly and do my best to bring glory to your name, and I can't catch a break. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes and in Psalms, um, we should be offended by that. We should recognize we live in a world broken by sin. We live in a world where sin is a reality. But Habakkuk reminds us that when God seems distant or far off, when God seems silent, and sometimes he does seem silent, sometimes he is silent. When that happens, we are to remind ourselves of who God is and who he's always been, not trying to figure out what he's doing. Uh, one of my favorite quotes says that uh, God is doing 10,000 things a day in your life, and you might be aware of three. You might not be aware of any of them. God doesn't call us to try to figure out what he is actively doing in our lives this day and tomorrow. He calls us to remember. If you have your Bibles open, flip over to Psalm 77. The Psalms are helpful. My favorite description of them is the school of prayer language. If you ever want to learn the language of prayer, just memorize the Psalms and begin to pray the Psalms. They teach you how to pray. You'll find every human emotion somewhere in the Psalms. Every human emotion is dealt with in the Psalms. In Psalm 77, it says, I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. The day of my trouble, I seek the Lord, and in the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan, and when I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyelids open. I'm so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old, the years long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. And then my spirit made a diligent search. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? 
Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You're the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The clash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lighted up the world, and the earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Now, we could spend all night talking about that one, but there's two things that go on in that psalm. There's the emotion of, I feel like God has forgotten me. There's uh, in verse uh, 8, he says, Will his steadfast love, has it ceased? Are his promises at an end? And so he's dealing with these very real emotions. I feel like God is not helping me. I feel like God doesn't care. I feel like God has turned his back on me. But then he turns the corner and says, When I feel like this, I'm going to remind myself of who God has been. I'm going to remind myself of all that God has done because all that God has done and all that he has been is true going forward. And so he says, specifically, he's talking about, um, in verses 19 and 20, he's talking about the Exodus when the Israelites walked through the Red Sea. You can't, you can't tell somebody, hey, your path was not to go around the water. It was just to cut a path right through it unless they're God. So he's saying, I'm, I'm going to remember that when faced with an immovable object, something that would have stalled any and everybody else, you just, you God, you just cut a path through the middle of it. And you weren't even seen. You weren't even seen. So let's go back to Habakkuk. It's essentially where Habakkuk finds himself. Uh, he's unique. He brings together a few different strands of the Bible. He's a prophet. He uh, writes a psalm. Habakkuk chapter 3 is a psalm. Uh, he's a sage, which means he's kind of like a wise uh, teller of things. And then a seer means he can, he can see into the future. So he, 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 he prophesies about some things that are going to happen. And so looking into the struggles of a godly man, and that's something that, that's helpful. Godly people struggle. Godly people worry. Godly people have anxiety. Godly people need help. That's helpful just by itself. But these are the inner struggles of a godly man, and God intends it for our help. God knew we were going to be faced with situations uh, that Habakkuk will help us with. And so he means it for our help. So that first question there on the bottom page one, does God care? In his prayers, he's asking, does God care? Look at uh, Habakkuk chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 1. The oracle of Habakkuk, the prophet. He says, O Lord, how long will I, shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. So that's his prayer. I don't know if you all ever pray like that. It's almost an accusation against God. I mean, he, he is seeing some terrible things. They are not making sense to him. He can't see any path forward. He says justice, even justice itself is perverted. I know the word, but the idea is perverted. And then you look what, look what uh, he says in verse 3. He accuses God of being passive when it comes 
to evil. He says, why do you look idly at wrong? Why do you sit there and do nothing when wrong is happening? Why do you tolerate it? He asked him. The prophet is concerned over social injustice. He's concerned over violence. He's concerned over the fact that his home country is being oppressed by others while being wicked on their own. Uh, Historically, or chronologically, if you will, um, the wicked king Manasseh has gone on. He's died, most likely. But the influence of his reign is still, still in effect. Now, if you remember back when we looked at uh, Manasseh in Kings and Chronicles, uh, he was one of, if not the most wicked king in Judah. He reigned for a long time, around 50, I think 54 years. And he led the people to do what was wicked in the sight of God. And so it was taking, the the people had a 50-year influence of wickedness when Habakkuk is writing this, when he's watching this and writing these things in his journal. And so it's just... Manasseh's influence was still wreaking havoc on the people. The leader was wicked. The priests were wicked. There was no genuine holiness in Judah. Now, ultimately, uh, Manasseh's son was godly. Uh, King Josiah, I think. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) But his son was godly and came in and began to reform the nation, but it would take a long time because it takes people a long time to change. When you get set in your ways doing something, it takes a long time to change. When you get set in your ways doing the wrong thing, it can take a long time to begin to see clearly, much less turn to the right thing. And so Habakkuk is lamenting, hey, this, this is just bad. Well, in verse 5, God begins to answer Habakkuk and to show him, hey, your prayer always welcomed, but it's wrong. Look at verse five. God says, look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded from doing a great work in your days that you would not believe if told. Behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swift to devour. They all come, from, come for violence. All their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. So Habakkuk says, God, why are you staring at evil and not doing anything about it? And God says, well, hang on, because I'm going to do something that you're not going to understand. I'm going to raise up this other nation who's wicked, who's selfish, who's sinners, they're so self-centered that they worship their own power. They go about devouring and demolishing all kinds of kingdoms. I'm going to raise them up to come in here and take you out. That's God's initial answer to Habakkuk's prayer. Now imagine you prayed that prayer that Habakkuk prayed, and that's God's answer to you. Essentially, you thought that was bad. I'm about to show you something bad. And a lot of times we think, if I, if I pray an earnest, genuine prayer, God will answer me in a helpful way. That's sometimes an unhealthy assumption we make. That if I pray, and I mean it, and my prayer is godly, then God will give me the answer I'm looking for, or God will help me in my prayers. And don't get me wrong, brothers and sisters, God helps us. He does. But sometimes his help is to help us see that we're wrong, which sometimes comes through confrontation first, rather than throwing his arm around us and say, hey, good job, sport. That's what he's doing with Habakkuk. He's confronting that wrong prayer. He's telling Habakkuk, look, you've misunderstood. Because you've misunderstood, you have misprayed. And your prayer is wrong. It's not wrong to pray, make our laments known to God. This is one of those grammatical errors that's important. Uh, But we ought to expect God to bring correction when we are wrong. We ought to pray. We ought to lament over sin. We ought to say, God, don't you care? 
But we ought to also be prepared for God to say, you have misunderstood. You have prayed beyond what you can get, what you can comprehend. And that's what God is doing here with Habakkuk. Habakkuk's taken a few pieces of truth that he sees and he's decided what's going on. He's pulled some of these pieces together and he says, okay, this is what's going on. There's evil, there's wickedness, God is not doing anything, therefore God is being passive. That was his thought process. And God is saying, you don't, you've misunderstood. Your process is wrong. Therefore, your conclusion is wrong. We look at the world, we look what's going on. We often make some kind of judgment that we feel is accurate because uh, we feel pretty accurate in our assessments most of the time. We can watch the news and make a decision. We can look at Facebook and make a decision. We feel like, for whatever reason, we know what's going on. And so we look at the details, we make our assumptions, we make our, our uh, uh, decisions, and then we pray about them. Or we, go, we, we base our decisions on our own wisdom. Or we make decisions based on what we think is right. But God comes along and answers Habakkuk, hey, you're wrong. Your prayer is wrong. Your whole idea about what's going on is incorrect. Because he comes to him and says, look, I don't tolerate wrong. I'm not up here being passive about evil. I'm just not answering it in the time that you want me to. I'm not answering it in your time frame. But you see, Habakkuk had gotten kind of big for his britches and accused God of being late or accused God of doing nothing. And God is saying, look, it's just not happening when you would want it to happen. He tells Habakkuk that he would execute justice in Judah, but he would do it his way. Habakkuk wants God to come in and do it how he wants it done, but God says, I'm going to do it. It's just going to be my way, and it's going to be a way that you did not think of, that you would not understand. Why would God raise up a bitter and hasty nation? That's what he calls Babylon. He says, I'm going to raise up this bitter and hasty nation, this nation that's high on themselves. It says in verse 11, it's a nation whose might is their God. That's what he's going to use to bring judgment upon Judah. Babylon was a young nation during this time. They were still on their rise to power. They were still about, they were about to conquer Assyria and become a really controlling world power. This is what Nahum talked about. We talked about it last week when Assyria fell. Some of the descriptions of the armies that would overthrow Assyria, it's the same descriptions that God uses right here in Habakkuk because it was the Babylonian army that God used to overthrow Assyria. But it would be like God saying, I'm going to take uh, Las Vegas and punish the immorality of the rest of the country with Las Vegas. How does that make any sense? Or, at the end of World War II, it was like Hitler being replaced with Stalin, if you know history. And it's like saying, oh, how is that any better? That's probably worse. And that's what Habakkuk is saying. He's saying, how, how can you take a worse off people and use them to punish us? And so he hears God, but he just he can't get his head around it. But you see, I've noted there, Habakkuk's being schooled here. He's being taken to school, and he's being schooled in the program of God. He's being given insight into how God does things in the world. God tells him, Babylon's going to be my instrument. In Jeremiah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, the second king of Babylon, is called God's servant, if you remember that. And that's what God is telling Habakkuk. I'm going to raise them up and use them, but they're going to be my servant. They're going to, I'm going to use them as I want them. They will be a tool in my program. So Habakkuk's first question, uh, does God care? Not only has it not been answered yet, but it's been compounded. It's been made heavier. He, he doesn't have resolution. It's just harder now. God has made the question more complex. And so now it's, do you care, God? Because I don't feel like you care, even after hearing from him. And so Habakkuk began to praise once again. He's, he's kind of responding to God's strange justice. 
God's work, God's answer doesn't make sense to him. So he prays once again. Look at chapter 1, verse 12. It says, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord. You have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all them up with a hook. He drags them out of his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his net, makes offerings to his dragnet, for by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? Habakkuk says, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me, what I will answer concerning my compl- or, and what I will answer concerning my complaint. So here again, Habakkuk's asking the question again. He said, well, God, God, how is it that you can not punish evil right away, and your answer to that is to take somebody worse off than us, more sinful than us, and use them to punish us? How is that the case? He compares Babylon to um, uh, a merciless fisherman who is just taking as much fish as he can. Not what he needs. He's just catching fish after fish after fish, and he doesn't care. He's pulling up the righteous and the unrighteous, and he's just indiscriminate when it comes to who he wipes out and who he captures. So in chapter 2, verse 1, having finished his second prayer, Habakkuk says, all right, I'm going to wait. I'm just going to back up. I'm going to wait for God to answer me. I ask you, God, do you care? Your answer was confusing and startling. And so now I'm going to ask again, do you care? So then God responds once again. It says, the Lord answered me, this is chapter 2, verse 2. Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to its end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by faith. So when he's waiting... When Habakkuk is waiting, God finally answers. And his answer is a bit more uh, what we would call helpful this time. The first one was very helpful. Habakkuk just didn't see it that way at the time. It challenged him. It confronted him. And so he was frustrated by it. He prays again. But God answers him again. And chapter 2, verse 4, the second part of verse 4, is probably one of the most well-known verses in the book. It's quoted a few times in the New Testament. The part where he says, the righteous shall live by his faith. Paul quotes this, as I said, in Romans chapter 1 and Galatians chapter 3. But here the word faith, the Hebrew word faith, can also be translated faithfulness. The righteous shall live by his faithfulness. And that's, that's a bit, I think it's a bit more helpful when we think about it that way. Because faithfulness implies action and a way of living. Sometimes faith, the word faith, can be a bit abstract for us. We don't know really what it means. Like if I, you know, if I said, hey, um, have faith in your pew. You demonstrate that when you sit down, right? It's really not faith, though. It's trust. Just trust your pew that it's going to be there. Faith, the Bible talks about in the, uh, I'm sorry, Hebrews uh, 11, says faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So how do you live by that? How do you live by faith? How do you live by the conviction of the things that we don't see? Because Paul talks about in uh, 2 Corinthians 4, we don't look to the things that we see because those things are already fading away. He says our hope is in the things unseen because those are eternal. So how is it that we live by convictions of things not seen? It translates to faithfulness. 
We live by faithfulness. We live by obedience to the word of God. We live, by, we live like God's word is true. We live like God's commands are true. And so when God is speaking to Habakkuk here, and he says the righteous shall live by his faithfulness, what he's saying is God's people will live like God is God no matter what's going on. There are going to be times in your life when things happen that confuse the mess out of you. And you're going to wonder, does God even care? How can this thing be happening and God be God? And God's response is, the righteous live by faithfulness. The righteous live with the assurance that God is who he is. The righteous live like Psalm 77. There are times when God is silent and I can't hear him, but I remember who he is and I remember who he always will be. The righteous live by or through faithfulness. And God is, God is telling Habakkuk, unlike the Babylonians who wipe out empire after empire without caring who they're wiping out, the righteous and the unrighteous, God tells Habakkuk, I'm not that careless. I don't punish my people with carelessness. Now we need to see God punishes his people. We've talked about 1 Peter, I think, when Peter says, don't, don't act like it's strange when uh, the judgment begins in the household of God because that's, that is where God's judgment begins inside of his own people. And God is saying, I'm not like them. I'm going to use them, but I'm not like them. Don't accuse me of being like them. The righteous shall live by their faithfulness. And so God is kind of rebuking Habakkuk here. And he's saying, don't just trust in who I am. Also trust what I do. And that can be hard. We trust who God is. But sometimes it's hard to look at the world and say, all right, God, you're doing that, and I'm okay with it. So if you're watching the news last night and all day today, and you're just dismayed about what might happen next, we need to remember, not only is God true and trustworthy, God did that. Daniel chapter 2 says that God appoints leaders and God removes leaders. Romans chapter 13 says that God puts leaders in government for his purposes. 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter says, respect uh, the emperor and the governors because they do God's work. We don't understand why God puts certain pe people in leadership when he does, but the Bible says he does. It's his doing. And so God is telling Habakkuk and God is telling you and me, trust who I am. Trust what I do. And the same is true with this uh, virus. We don't know why. We don't know why it's here. But God has purpose in it. And we're to trust him in it. And we are to live faithfully. Well, God wants to make sure Habakkuk knows he's not careless when it comes to punishing evildoers. And so in, chapter, in verses 6 through 20, God spends a bunch of time condemning Babylon. He gives six woe statements. Woe to you is what he's saying. There's this wicked people, Babylon. Habakkuk cannot get his mind around the fact that God is going to use them for his purposes. But God also wants Habakkuk to understand they're not going to be faultless. They're not going to be held guiltless. They're going to receive their punishment. And so we see these woe statements. He says, woe to you who amasses what is not his. Woe to you who dishonestly makes his wealth. Chapter 2, verse 12, woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed. Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, awake, and to a silent stone, arise. And he's really kind of drawing the distinction between the Christian and the non-Christian here. How does a faithful person respond to God? How does a faithless person respond to God? A faithful person responds to God by seeing their sin and taking God's side against their own sin. A Christian says, I'm sinful. I have offended a holy God, and I need to repent of that sin because that sin is wicked. Whereas a non-Christian takes the side of their sin against God. A non-Christian says, I, I, don't, I'm not, I don't have any problem with my sin. 
I don't need to repent. I don't want to repent. And so they set themselves against God. And that's what we're seeing here. Judah, as the people of God, have the opportunity to respond and repent. And some of them do, which is why Habakkuk, it's noted here in Habakkuk 2, the righteous live faithfully. The unrighteous live faithlessly. But the, the woe statements about the idolatry are really where I think God is making his point. He says in chapter 2, verse 19, Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, Awake, to a silent stone, arise. In verse 20 it says, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. And so Habakkuk is kind of juxtapositioning God and Babylon. He's putting up for our consideration idolatry and true worship of God. Because what we see is that the image is fools yelling at rocks while the righteous stand silent before a holy God. That's the picture. Those who live faithfully are over here standing silent before God who we realize he is in control. He has full and total control over everything. Even the bad stuff that's happening is happening because he is in control. And that demands my utter silence. Who am I to speak to a God like that? But over here are the fools speaking to a piece of wood saying, get up, get up and save me. And it's meant, it's meant to make us see the foolishness of it. And yet that's the world we live in. People worship idols of all kinds. People worship idol, the idol of money. The idol of, uh, of job, the idol of image, the idol of whatever. And we're meant to see ourselves here. If we, are, uh, if we are worshiping an idol over God, we're like the people calling out to rock saying, get up, get up and save us. Whereas the righteous stand silently before the Lord because he is in his holy temple. So the effect of all of these woe statements in chapter 2, when God finally pronounces woe on Babylon. Now remember, it hadn't happened yet, because back in uh, chapter 2, verse 3, God says, if it seems slow, wait for it, because it's coming. Right? It's like God knows our hearts doubt him sometimes, right? Uh, God, it's not happening fast enough. Even though Habakkuk doesn't think it's going to happen, God promises that it's going to happen. And the effect of these woe statements is to remind Habakkuk of the reality of who God is and ultimately how small Babylon is. Now let that sink in, all right? God changed nothing for Habakkuk. As a matter of fact, the worst was yet to come for him. Babylon was still going to come in and wipe Judah off the map. That was still going to happen. But the effect of God's word was to remind him, was to remind Habakkuk of who God is. That's what Habakkuk lost sight of. Habakkuk lost sight of the, the reality of who God is, and so he began to wander off. He began to wander off into little faith and doubt. He began to wander off into worry and anxiety. And so without changing anything about the situation as it was, God takes Habakkuk's eyes and kind of turns his head back to look at the right thing. Don't forget who I am is what God says to Habakkuk. And so in chapter 3, he finally worships. He says, chapter 3, verse 2, O Lord, I've heard the report of you and your work. O Lord, do I fear in the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Taman, the Holy One, from the Mount of Paran. His splendor covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light, rays flashed from his hands, and there he veiled his power. And so, this right view of God changes Habakkuk. Now think about that. Sometimes we think for uh, for us to be helped, something has to change. Some outward circumstance has to change. Something has to change, just not me. And yet in the midst of his worry and anxiety, in the midst of his anger and frustration, God comes into Habakkuk's life and says, you're looking at the wrong thing. 
you're focused on the wrong thing. You've misunderstood the world. And you see, brothers and sisters, when we misunderstand the world, our anxiety goes through the roof. When we misunderstand what real power is, we begin to worry and get scared about all kinds of things. It's like a little kid um, in a store. If y'all ever had small children, or you know, some of us have small children currently and are just worn down, we're the tired looking ones. Uh, when you're in a store and there's a big crowd and your small child is with you, typically they tend to stay a little closer to your leg when there's a bunch of people milling around. And as long as you're near, they feel comfortable. They might even wander off a little bit as long as they can see you. But as soon as their vision is blocked, what happens? Say what? They start looking for you. They get scared. They get undone. Some kids go into all-out meltdown. My kid happens to take advantage of it and she goes for a walk sometimes. <laughs> but what tends to happen is when a small child gets separated from their parent, even if it's only by a few feet, even if that parent has eyes on them, they begin to panic because security's gone. The world is over. And that's just like what we are. As long as our eyes are on the Father, as long as we are near to Him and His Word, we're okay. The world can fall apart. Psalm 46 says, Though the mountains quake and fall into the heart of the sea, I will not be afraid. Do you know what happens if we're not near God and the mountains start falling down into the sea? We are afraid. When we take our eyes off of the Father, when we, when we remove ourselves from his presence, and I'm talking about the Bible here, Peter calls this a more sure testimony than being with Jesus himself. When, when we remove ourselves from God's word, take our eyes off the Father, anything will scare us. Anything will, will make us come undone. And yet just like when, you're, when your child comes back to you and is comforted, because all is right with the world again, the same thing happens with us when we are near the Father and are reminded of who He is. And so this psalm, I won't go through it, but you can see it there on the notes, and you can, I would encourage you to read it. Because in this psalm, Habakkuk reminds himself, God is a warrior. God's not passive. God's not looking at sin like nothing can happen. God is a warrior who will ride in and make things right. There's an image of this in Revelation 19. It's a great song about it. It's a rap song. I don't know if y'all, some of y'all probably don't like rap music. But it's a Christian rap artist uh, wrote a good song about Revelation 19. He's just working through the text. And in Revelation 19, it says that Jesus is going to show up on the scene riding on a, right, a white horse. And he's going to come to lay waste to the world. It says uh, he will have a sharp sword in his mouth with which he will strike down all the nations. And you know what that word is? I'm sorry, do you know what that sword is? <laughs> Just told you. <laughs> it's his word. It's not a physical sword. It's his word. All he has to say is right or wrong, and we will agree. If we are in Christ, as soon as he says you are right, we will say because of you. And if he says wrong, if he says you're in sin, we will be forced to say you're right. Because he is a warrior. And so how do, you know, just, just quickly, how do we apply this book? Habakkuk, we see that though he's got his personal struggles with God, this is another one of his grammatical errors, Habakkuk discovers that God is not blind to injustice. God will not be silent when it comes to judgment. He is a God who hears when we cry. He is a divine warrior who goes to battle for his people. He is the God who is sovereign over history, over nations, over empires, over rulers, over presidents, over senates, over all of it. And he is the God who is sovereign over each of our lives. The God who appointed Nebuchadnezzar is the same God who is in the process right now of appointing our next president. And he is the same God who is right now in charge of your life. And he cares about each equally. And he's overseeing all of it. 
And so in the midst of everything, Habakkuk's called to live faithfully. That's his job. Not to receive an answer, not to change the world. God says your job is to live with faith. Your job is to live obediently. Your job is to remember who I am and to live like I am who I am. To trust what I'm doing. I think the ending of Habakkuk is my favorite part because I I feel like I can resonate with it. Maybe you can too. Habakkuk 3 verse 17, he says, Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on the high places. So maybe you're, you can identify with this. Uh, it seems like everything's going wrong. It seems like nothing's going right. Uh, there's no food in the pantry. There's no money to pay the bills. There's no health in my body. There's no more life in my body. There's no more uh, emotional healing that can take place in the relationship. There's just hopelessness. When I look out from my seat, I see emptiness, hopelessness, and death. And yet, Habakkuk says, even when that's the case, I'll remember and I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Even when the world seems like it's crashing down, even when it seems like everything's coming undone, I will remind myself of who God is and what he's done. And I will remember that I'm called to live faithfully. Called to live faithfully. Any um, thoughts or questions before I close in prayer? All right, let me pray. Lord, thank you for time together in your word. And Lord, thank you for uh, the gift of Habakkuk. Thank you for his life. Thank you for how you ministered to him. Thank you for how you ministered to us through him. Father, I pray that you would remind us that even when it seems like the world is going wrong, even when it seems like things are coming undone, even when, Lord, we are just confused by the things that are happening, we can trust that you are who you are, and we can trust that what you do is good. Father, help us to be reminded that we live, we are called to live by faith. We are called to live faithfully in the world. And Father, because of you, because of the promise of Jesus Christ, because of the hope of eternal life with you through the forgiveness of our sins, we can say with Habakkuk, even when it seems like everything is dead and gone and hopeless, even when it seems like that, I know that's not true. I know that you are my God. I know that you are faithful. I know that you caused me to walk on the high places. I know that my life is hidden with Christ in God. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.